You guys know I love book tags and my favorite word is recommendations. This is the book recommendations tag. This tag has been making its rounds on YouTube for a while now. I feel like it's been a few months and I keep seeing it come up. I keep telling myself that I want to do it. I keep writing it down in like the monthly videos to film and put up and yet I have not done it. But now we're here and we are going to talk hyper specific book recommendations. There's a list of 15 questions made by the creator of the tag, Steph Borer. I'll tag her down in the description. It is all in the purpose of giving more specific book recommendations recommendations and diving a little bit deeper into our bookshelves. I, as you guys know, love book tags. I love recommending books. It is why we are here. And so I'm very excited to hopefully bring you guys some new recommendations that you may not have heard of before. I don't know if that's true or not because I talk about the same books all the time, but that doesn't matter. That is semantics. Let us get into it. <laughs> First question we have is a book you tell people is your favorite. Most recently, my answer has changed. I feel like if you were to ask me in the past, I would have said middle game, Addie LaRue, Way of Kings. Like it was always kind of the same answer there for a while. However, I read Daughter of No Worlds by Carissa Broadbent. And so this is my most recent answer. I feel like whenever anybody's been asking me a recommendation as of late, or if people have been asking me like, oh my God, Mel, what's one book you love? Gave it five stars, really, really enjoyed it. It was Daughter of No Worlds. I struggle a lot with fantasy romance or romanticies or romance heavy fantasies, however we want to phrase it. And and it typically is because they feel underdeveloped and particularly the romance side of it doesn't feel quite realistic. Like it doesn't feel kind of justified as to why they love each other. Not that there needs to be specifically like a justification for it. However, I would like to see the chemistry. I would like to see that build up to understand exactly why the characters are into each other. And Daughter of No Worlds gave me all of that and more. Not only is the world super interesting and our character has sort of dark Phoenix, Wanda Maximoff magic, which I absolutely love. Her powers are awesome. Awesome. Also, the way that the fight sequences are structured and the way that the magic system comes up is fascinating. And I love the conflict of the book, but we also get a super detailed account of the love section of it all. We get to see firsthand how Tasana and Max become friends after him not really wanting to do anything with her. And then from being friends, how that slowly dives into the romantic side of things and slowly into a relationship situation. And so I absolutely love that we get to see kind of all stages of it. And we get to see that care and that love grow through time. It's not something that magically shows up right off the bat. It's something that again, built with time. And I love that. And so in this one we follow Tasana, who is a slave, has been one for a long time, and she manages to buy herself her freedom. But now she wants to make sure that nobody ends up in the same situation she was and to help everybody who is currently in that landscape. And so she goes to the orders in the hopes that they will help her annihilate this dynamic that currently exists in the world, and they will help train her, they will allow her to train with them, and they will give her all of the tools that she needs but that will obviously come with a cost. Currently reading Children of Fallen Gods and having a great time with it, slowly chipping away at it because it's not like my priority read at the moment, but I'm still quite enjoying the second one. And the cover for the third, stunning. Next up, we have got a book that is your guilty pleasure. And let me tell you something. <laughs> this is a newest entry, okay, into the collection of favorites. And am I guilty about it necessarily? No, but it was the first thing to come to mind when I think of guilty pleasure, because it is one of those things that I'm like, damn, this sounds like the exact opposite of what I would enjoy. And yet I find myself gobble gobble the entire book. And it was a great time. And so I'm talking about Magnolia Parks. This was an unlikely entry into my favorites. I didn't think I would enjoy this. Everybody and their mother on TikTok has been absolutely loving this. And I was scared because I'd heard, you know, Gossip Girl said in London, it's super toxic. It is a romance because there is a lot of like romantic vibes to it. But at the core of the story really is this very toxic relationship that both of our main characters, BJ and Magnolia, can't seem to escape no matter who they date, what they try. And I guess like what distance they put in between themselves, it seems like this inevitable 
double cycle that they keep circling around each other and and so it kind of brings up the question of even though the dynamic is so messed up are these people actually destined to be with each other and at times it does feel like that but it doesn't negate how toxic and awful they are to each other they find ways to continuously hurt each other just to make sure that they still care and so they've got tactics in place for themselves to assure themselves of that instead of just communicating and so because I think this book pretends to be nothing other than what it is I think that's why I enjoyed it so much because there is no pretext it's like this is what you get this is what it is you with that what you will and so I really ended up enjoying this I mean as far as the synopsis goes I think what I've mentioned kind of covers the synopsis but anyway as like a small thing we follow Magnolia and BJ who had a pre-existing relationship and an event went down that separated them from each other and they are no longer together however they are very much still in love and so we we observe their daily life as they are very much codependent however they are still either canoodling or in relationships with other people and how they keep bringing other people into this very messed up dynamic that they've got going on and it's very again rich people drama which is again why I enjoyed it so much it's a great time I don't know if I'm guilty about it but I do enjoy it a book everyone loved but you didn't I didn't even have to think about it twice I feel like for a lot of these I was like oh what am I gonna pick I don't know what to pick and then for this one <laughs> Fourth wing. Basically, the story follows Violet, who is one of the general's daughters, as she goes into War Academy, particularly to train to be a dragon rider, which is very much a legacy thing in this world. If your parents, if your siblings, if people in your family have been a dragon rider, you are kind of expected to follow down that same path. However, this is not what she wanted to do with her time or with herself. She does not want to be actively involved in the war, especially because she does have EDS and she is very much used to people underestimating her. And it's very much, I think, over the years gotten into her head and she has this very I think self-sabotaging voice at the back of her head that continuously gets beat as the story goes on. I think what the book navigates so very well is the growth that Violet has from somebody who feels very inadequate because she has been made feel like she is inadequate to somebody who is confident, to somebody who is self-assured, to somebody who is very assertive and somebody who knows her worth now and knows why she is doing things and that she is doing them for herself not to prove anything to anybody else and so I think as far as the the growth of the character I loved that I loved again the dragons were a big part of the story they are characters they are present they are there I think where the book falls into a very lackluster place for me is the fact that the romance again feels underdeveloped in a way that I personally don't enjoy I want to see why the characters like each other why they're vibing why they love each other where's the attraction where's the chemistry how do all of these things become one to the point where you want to be with this person and I didn't really see that throughout the story because Satan and Violet don't really know each other. Satan knows Violet but Violet does not know Satan. That part to me didn't quite machinate in the way that I wanted it to and then also when it comes to the world building it felt like we were focusing on things that while well, yes were important weren't the overarching thing I would have wanted to know about the world. I was missing the politics. I was missing the the entire plot behind the war. What was it necessarily that we were fighting against or protecting ourselves from? And politics for me when it comes to fantasy, particularly things that very clearly drive the world. I want to know what they are. I was kind of left wanting for more. A book that you read the fastest. I was going through my shelves because listen, I did go through a phase where I was reading books very, very fast. I wanted to beat the clock, beat the time, beat myself, beat everything. And I just kept reading so, so much, so very fast. And I didn't quite know what my answer would be because I, I really don't know how to quantify that because I think it also just depends on, obviously I can read a 100 150 page book in, in an hour and a half or do I grab a book that's a thousand pages long and you know and so how do how do I quantify time when it is also very relative to the size of the book let me show you because I am a crazy individual who read both of these books in basically either 24 or 36 hours Jade Legacy I basically read in a single day and then Way of Kings I think I read all in all in two days and so I would say these are the ones that I've read the 
fastest because of the length because I, I think I cannot compare a 150 page book you know I still have yet to read Words of Radiance we're gonna work on it this year hopefully we're already in June halfway through the year how long have I been saying that for and now we'll see what happens but Jade Legacy though is the last installment in the Greenbone Saga and the Greenbone Saga basically focuses on the Cowl family who are legendary Greenbone warriors and they utilize Jade to enhance their own strengths and abilities in order to defend their clans, their areas from other Jade warrior clans. Very martial arts centric. It's very politic driven. It is very much family centric as well. It is a family saga first and foremost. So we are going to observe the family's shenanigans and all of the drama, I think, inside the doors, inside the house. And so loved every second of this. And then for Way of Kings, he, we have a war that has been going on for years being fought over a series of Kasims. Said Kasims are connected by the Bridgesman. And so we follow particularly Kaladin, who is a Bridgesman, and his journey in this whole war. And then on the other side of the war, we have got Dalinar, who is the king's brother, who keeps dreaming, hallucinating, seeing a text called The Way of Kings. And he feels it is up to him to figure out exactly why he is seeing it and how it's so connected to the war. And then on the third side, we have got Shalon, who is training to be a scholar, and she will make some massive discoveries that will aid in the war and the war is made so much more difficult through magical artifacts called shard blades and shard plates that again enhance people's abilities and these are granted to them by the knights radiant who are like these super like mystical individuals who possess immense amounts of power and it is amazing and i love it and i want to read words of radiance but i'm scared and intimidated next up we have got a book you think deserves more hype and for this one i picked half a soul by Olivia Atwater. I really don't know if people are talking about this or not, but I haven't seen a lot of people actively talk about this one. Maybe it's because I'm not online as much that I just post and skedaddle that I really don't see a lot of things, but Half a Soul is one that I absolutely loved. It is a cozy Regency fantasy romance, and the vibes in this one are truly elite. We follow our main character, Dora, whose mom wants to make sure she gets married, you know, kind of Bridgerton, like the diamond of the season. We need to make sure we are getting you a nice suit that you get married, that your life is kind of set. But Dora doesn't quite display emotion in the way that her peers do, which brands her as having half a soul and being cursed. However, she doesn't feel inadequate. She feels just okay with the way that she is, with the way that she feels, and with the way that she presents herself to other people. She is so unapologetically herself. And in the midst of that, she ends up meeting Elias Wilder and the Lord Sorcier, who she really doesn't want a lot to do with, but it will bring her into fairy affairs, which is the last thing she probably imagined she'd be roped into. And it just brings in such a whimsy atmosphere into the book. The romance in this is absolutely gorgeous. I loved every single second of this. It really is a book to get lost in. And I think also because the book is not very long, it just makes for such a perfect, you know, when the rain is pouring and you want to like cozy up with a drink and your blankie, I think this is a perfect book to cozy up to and just read read and love. Did I grab this as an excuse to talk about The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes? Yes, a book that is becoming a movie or a TV show, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins. Currently don't have my copy because my brother is borrowing it because he's also dying to read it. I hope he started it by now. I need to hear his updates. However, I loved this book so much and it's so funny to me because I DNF'd this book three years ago and then I picked it back up just a few weeks ago and I fell in love with it. Book follows Coriolano Snow, who's the president in the Hunger Games. As he is in high school, he is a teenager and he is a mentor in the 10th Hunger Games. And he ends up meeting Lucy Gray Baird, who is the tribute he has the mentor and the story goes from there. It really at its core is, I think, a perfect outlook into this is what a single human's impact can be. And we get to see how much involvement he has with the games, how he gets to understand the machinations of it all. And 
and what would benefit the games, what doesn't benefit the games, and how that in the long run ends up becoming what we conventionally know as the 74th, 75th, and the ones that came before that Hunger Games. And so I think it was, it was a fascinating, immersive experience to go inside his brain and kind of see his motivations and see where he is headed with these things and why he is doing them. It all comes from a huge survival instinct and this this really sort of twisted and almost like this Machiavellian need to survive and to provide for himself and make sure that he is okay. I think it is very clear throughout the story that any feeling he has comes from that sense of survival, comes from that sense of self-preservation. And I think it's very fascinating just the, seeing the character depth and exactly why things are happening within the story. It is just so, so good. I cannot wait to see it on the screen. I think it's going to be phenomenal. I'm just excited about this one because I'm ready to step into my Delulu time with The Hunger Games again. A book you have reread the most. I used to reread this once or twice a year. It was genuinely a problem. I used to read this way too much, too repeatedly, and I have not reread it in two years now, so I'm here for my recovery period. <laughs> a Court of Thorns and Roses, by, by Miss Janet. I read this a lot, too many times one would argue. And now I, I kind of don't want to look at them again. You know, I feel like I've run my course with this one. I don't even know if I'm going to read the, the latest Crescent City book when it comes out. I'm not quite sure where I stand with this one. I think the more I read her books, the less I enjoy them. And so I'm, I'm kind of at this, at this weird standstill at the moment. So there's that. A book from a genre you don't typically read. I kind of struggled with this one, not gonna lie. I had a lot of options, but between literary fiction, romance, horror, thriller, but it was made clear to me when I saw the push that I needed to talk about this one because I truly enjoyed every single second of this book. And I think through this and Tokyo Ueno Station, that is a literary fiction, I figured out that I really love books that are character studies. I love when it's so very internal and we get to see the way that a character's mind works very closely and that perhaps there's not a lot lot of plot to the book, but there is a lot of themes to the book that are explored through the mind of said character. We follow Blythe, who is a mother, and she has given birth to her new baby, Violet, who she is determined to absolutely love and adore and raise with the best conditions around her. However, she is very quickly unsettled as she has her baby. And I think the book mostly speaks to the uncomfortable sides of motherhood that nobody wants to address about the sacrifices and the postpartum depression and about maybe even that lack of connectivity between the child and the mother and exactly what could lead to that and is there really a way to fix it but more importantly in, in Blythe's case what happens when you are seeing things and actively telling the people around you that you are seeing these things but nobody is believing you and so I think it also speaks to a bigger conversation on a lot of women are ignored when they speak their truth and it is disregarded as you're crazy, you're delusional, you don't know what you're talking about, women and their things. And so I think the book does a really great job at navigating all of those themes and conversation. I was also told that it was giving the orphan vibes, the movie, and it definitely does. There are parts of this book that again are very unsettling, just like the visual of it that reminded me a lot of the movie. And I love the movie, so I loved the book. A book that deserves all the hype it gets, Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. I I think I am coming to appreciate romance books or books that have a romantic element to them that really showcase how romance, love, relationships fit in the grander scheme of somebody's life because it is not the sole focus of people's lives. There are so many other things happening on the daily that I love just seeing regular people fall in love and exactly how they navigate those situations, I guess. We follow our two main characters, Ava and Shane, who have a long withstanding history with each other. They are now estranged. They haven't talked in years. However, they keep writing to each other through their books. They are both writers. Ava is an erotica author. And then Shane is sort of this speculative fiction, I think, literary fiction author. And they end up seeing each other again after years of having this crazy week together at a Black author's book event. And things go from there as they try and rekindle what they had and try and really talk about what was it exactly that happened when they last 
talked. And what worked so well for me with this book is that we get to see the characters live their individual lives. So who are they separate from this romance? We get to see Ava as an erotica author really struggle with her craft and really falling out of love with the stories that she has been writing. We see her as a mom. We see her as somebody who lives with a chronic illness that is very invisible and how that affects her daily life. And then with Shane, we see him be an author. We see him be a teacher. We see him be a parent figure to his kids at school that are continuously ongoing these really tough situations outside of school and their households. And then we come to see them as lovers, as people who are in this relationship, in this partnership together, and how, again, that love looks like in the grander scheme of their lives when they are trying to find themselves in the crazy world and trying to keep themselves afloat and deal with mental health struggles, mental illness, chronic illnesses. How does their love fit into that? And how do they need each other to show up in their lives on top of everything else going on? And so I loved this. I love every second of this and deserves all of the hype. A book you typically recommend when you are asked to give a recommendation that will forever and always be Middle Game by Shannon McGuire. I absolutely adore this book. It is so different to anything I've ever read. In this one, we have got Roger and Dodger who are twins and they are very gifted. Dodger is very gifted in mathematics and numbers. She understands all of the logic side of it, whereas Roger is very skilled in linguistics, languages, literature, writing, anything to do with words. He understands them very well. And the cloud hanging over their head is called Reed, who is an alchemist that is trying to achieve the doctrine of ethos through these two individuals. They literally build babies <laughs> in labs, quite literally, to see which ones will finally be able to ascend into godhood and play a bigger part in the world. And we particularly see that through the lens and scope of Roger and Dodger. The book is is so very lyrical and purple prose and so beautiful. Reading this book gave me continuous chills. There is this sense of inevitability to it all and there is also I think a race against the clock really where you you kind of wonder as they go through this journey of achieving or getting to that doctrine, will they get it? Won't they get it? What will happen if they don't? What will happen if they do? And the sense of urgency and tension is so very high with this one that it just makes for such a compulsively readable book. A book that has got your favorite character or characters, a plural, and I went for characters, plural, and I chose Wicked Fox. I love this book so much. I at some point do want to reread it because I had such a great time reading this. We follow Mi Young, who is a nine-tailed fox, as she loses her fox speed, and it is found by one Ji Hoon. However, they have to partner up to figure out how to get this back to Myeong. And again, it's a race against the clock because if they don't do it by a certain date at a certain time, Myeong will die. And the reason why I love the character so much, particularly Myeong, is that she is continuously on the search or she is continuously pushed also to search who she is and what her identity is outside of her mother. She is a character that has always been told what to do. Her life has been very controlled. It has been very contained to what her mother deems correct or deems good for Mi Young, and she hasn't had a lot of liberties growing up, obviously because being a nine-tailed fox is so dangerous because they can be killed and hunted and whatnot. But I think the journey in this one to, to find her own sense of individuality is so beautiful. And I just fell in love with her character through that lens of, of her trying to, I guess, reconcile the mother that she loves so much and the mother who has sacrificed so much for her with the person that has also brought so much hurt into her life. And just reading about mother-daughter dynamics is, is so, I think, valuable to me as somebody who is also continuously trying to like reconcile that side of my life. And so I loved reading about Mi Young. I loved reading about her mom and her ultimate journey to find who she is as Mi Young. It's so beautiful. A book you wish you could live in. And the only reason why I'm saying this book, it's because of the hero's vibes it has. Also, if I were to not be in this academy, it would probably feel a lot more low maintenance. Mayhaps, perhaps, that is The Atlas Six by Olive e. Blake. I just really like powers. Like, that would be great. If I could teleport places, 
that would be great. The amount of traffic I'd be able to skip if I could just, I don't know, read minds or something. That would be so freaking cool. And so I love the concept of having powers. I grew up watching Heroes. It was one of my favorite shows. And I think because it is set in a regular world landscape where it feels very contemporary and it, it doesn't have to exist within like a dystopia of a kind. I think that's why I love it so much. Like the prospect of that is very cool to me. It's a little bit terrifying, but I think I would I would love to have powers. We do follow these six characters as they go into the Alexandrian society to test who is going to stay here and pass the trial period. It's very cutthroat. I don't like that part, but I do like the powers. A book you thought you would hate, but ended up loving. Once Upon a Broken Heart by Stephanie Garber. I did not think I was going to enjoy this, primarily because I'd also been told that I would not like this. I obviously went through a big period of time where I was not reading YA. After I read Middle Game and I read Way of Kings and I read all of these adult fantasies for the very first time, kept going back to YA fantasy and it kept being very lackluster. I just, I was like, I don't want this. I don't need this. And so whenever I would read YA fantasy books in particular, I would not have a good time. And so I think that a lot of that played into why people thought I wouldn't enjoy this. I also think it's a lot about the timing as well. If I would have read this maybe two years ago, maybe I wouldn't have enjoyed it. However, ended up reading this this year and I loved every second of this. I love whimsical stories. I love stories that feel like fairy tales, even though they are not. Or maybe when they do have a fairy tale-esque tone or element inside the story that is made up for that particular purpose. I love it. I love it so much. And so in this one, we follow Evangeline Fox as she meets one of the fates in this world called Jax and they strike a deal for him to stop her beloved's wedding to somebody else. <laughs> and he will grant her her wish as long as he grants him three kisses that he will use for XYZ purpose on whomever he wants to utilize that with. This is ultimately all vibes, rarely any plot. The plot really kicks in in the second book, I think is when we really start to understand what is going on because obviously Jax has a plan, but you don't know what it is in book one. And so book one, there's again this huge cloud hanging over everybody's heads as true okay so what's going on where are we headed what are we doing where are we going but i loved the world i loved how campy i think and over the top it was a book that made you cry every book makes me cry everything makes me cry i'll go out to watch fast and furious and i'll cry that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you know what I mean? I cry at everything. The Poet X though, I will say, will qualify as something I, I cried with. In this one, we follow Xiomara Batista, who feels very misunderstood in her household, in the neighborhood that she lives in. She feels very confined to the rules and stipulations and outlooks that her mom in particular has of the world and how she should handle herself. And she finds her release. And again, that sense of individuality through slam poetry. And so when she is invited, to participate in a slam poetry competition, she signs up to do so because she feels it is her only way that she is heard, that her voice matters. And there was something so beautiful, I think, about that journey with wanting to be heard and being heard, and also how we have to navigate the world as Latin women. I think particularly Xiomara as a teenager, finding out the things that really matter to her based on her upbringing and what are some things that she can live without that, again, are not hers, but are her mother's. I think it was a really beautiful exemplification of what it means to be Latin, what it means to be a woman, and, and again, what it means to find your voice and what your voice means to you and what you want to do with it. So I absolutely love this. It's written in verse. You listen to the audiobook, Elizabeth Acevedo narrates it herself, and it's a great time. And last but not least, a book you wish you could read for the first time. I feel like I always have the same answer for this. And up until I find something better, this will keep being my answer. That's going to be The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. There's just something... I think so special about this to me personally. I know a lot of people didn't enjoy this, but ultimately what resonated with me so much is, is Addie's fear when I first read the book. I was at a point in time where I was, you know, so uncertain with everything. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I don't know where I'm headed. I was so afraid of just the idea of time and death and what do I do with my life that will ultimately make somewhat of an impact in the grand scheme of things. And it, it, I think I was feeling 
so inadequate and just inconsequential, which you could argue that we are as humans, but I, I kind of was really struggling with my whole sense of self and I had not quite read a book that dealt with the struggles that I was going through at the time just very mentally and internally and so when I read Adi as, as a character who fears all of those same things and she feels like she is in a race against time that she has to beat time and she makes a deal with an entity to be immortal to get more time and to live her life the way that she wants to live it I absolutely fell in love with the story and so I think that's what's so very special to me and then the second time around I read it which I don't tend to reread books very often as you guys know I try to and then I don't finish them it's a whole thing I reread it the second time and then I, I found myself relating to Henry who is the love interest in this one and I didn't think I would find myself relating to a different character the second time I was reading it versus relating to Addy perhaps again just because I know what my personal fears are and, and, and what my uncertainties are I think in the long run and it was so very shocking to me to walk into a reread feeling just absolutely connected to Henry's own struggle with mental health and mental illness and depression and feeling like nobody will ever truly understand you for who you are and so where do you kind of seek I guess that validation does it come from outside does it come from within and I think ultimately he is on a journey to finding out who he is and, and being able to say, I am Henry and I am. And so I feel like that's where I am currently at mentally with like trying to figure out the who's Mel. Cause like it's, you kind of lose sight of that as you go along. And so it's a very beautiful book to me. It's just a very special book to me personally. Nobody else has to like it. If I'm the only one on this hill, I will die very much alone and very, very happy. And that is it for today, friends. That is the book recommendation stack. I hope that you enjoyed this one. If you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up down below. Subscribe if you haven't already. I have a Patreon always linked down below in case you want to support the channel further. If you've reached the end of the video, let us leave a fox emoji down below. Comment down below if you've read any of these books and feel free to answer any of these questions as well in the comments so that we can keep like an ongoing stream of recommendations down there. Love you guys so, so much and I will see you on the next one. Bye!